Um, so far, the workshop has followed a very nice uh, logical progression, which I'm going to break now. Uh, so this, this will be a, a big parenthesis. Um, so I open it here and I close it over there. Uh, in the, it's a parenthesis in the sense that uh, what I'm going to tell you about an introduction to chemical reactivity theory is not really needed to follow the next thoughts, uh, but it might be a good a good break um, for mental state, perhaps. Um, the, yeah, so, so we have to do this. Uh, first, uh, we are in the chemistry building at uh, EPFL. Uh, so they require that this one lecture should be about chemistry. <laughs> and also, uh, the Nobel Prize in DFT, as you know, went to chemistry. So it would not be in good taste to have a whole workshop on DFT and not have one chemical reaction on the black one. So uh, we have one chemical reaction here. Actually, Hardy uh, drew a benzene ring. Uh, but I'll, so I'll, I'll draw two benzene rings. And that's called naphthalene. And then we're going to react it with nitric acid and ask what uh, what we get. So first I should say uh, that the goal of chemical reactivity theory is quite different than the goal of electronic structure theory. The question in electronic structure theory is given a, a, a number of electrons and nuclei, uh, uh, what, what is the, the, the solution, uh, which, and more generally, which molecules can exist and what are their properties. In chemical reactivity theory, instead, the, the problem is uh, how can we determine the outcome of a chemical reaction knowing the properties of the molecules that are reacting. Knowing the properties of X, knowing the properties of Y, what is the outcome of the chemical reaction? You might think that all you need to do to solve the chemical reactivity theory problem then is to solve the electronic structure problem. After all, if you know the number of electrons in X and the number of electrons in Y, and you know the nuclei in X and Y, then you can solve the electronic structure problem for X and Y as one whole system and um, well calculate uh, all the minima in the potential energy surface and uh, change the position of the nuclei, find all of the uh, intermediate states, uh, transition states, and uh, calculate the, the possible pathways for this reaction. Um, but chemical reactivity theory is based on the assumption that that's not the most clever way to go about it. Uh, because chemistry has many simple rules uh, that suggest that um, that uh, theory that uses properties of the reacting molecules instead of uh, all electrons and all nuclei should be uh, in principle positive. Um, so, uh, for example, this in this case. Naphthalene and nitric acid in the presence of sulfuric acid. Um, does anyone know? <laughs> so you, that's a challenging problem for the computer. 76 electrons, I don't know how many electrons. Um, and yet, when you take a few grams of naphthalene and you drop it into nitric acid, uh, with 100%, close to 100% efficiency at room temperature, you find that this compound is formed with water to keep it balanced. Um, and the chemists have a, uh, a simple way to explain how this happens. And I checked with uh, a good organic chemist in, in my department to make sure that this explanation is, is right. So, so it goes more or less like this. So the explanation involves complex language, because in order to explain simple rules, you need to have this high, high level language that has words like electronegativity. 
and uh, electrophilic strong acid and there are oils. So the explanation is that uh, sulfuric acid is a very strong acid and so it protonates the nitric acid uh, and when it becomes H2NO3 plus it loses uh, water and it generates NO2 plus and NO2 plus is what's called an electrophilic free agent. And what that means is that uh, it is having for electrons, it is attracted to the pi clouds of the benzene ring. But what's really interesting in this reaction is that this reactant is more attracted almost ex exclusively to, to, to the alpha carbons. These are the alpha carbons, these, these four, than to the beta carbons. So even though you have four alpha carbons and four beta carbons, with 100% efficiency, you get this compound and not the one that has NO2 on this carb. Um, so the explanation is, well, first of all, why is the nitrogen and not the oxygen attached to the carbon? And the answer is, uh, has to do with electronegativity. Oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. And uh, that means that the electrons are pulled more towards the oxygen than the nitrogen. So the positive end of the molecule is on the nitrogen. And that is the, the region that affects the, the pi clouds. So let's start with electronegativity. That uh, has uh, different scales. This is molecules. Electronegativity with chi, not to confuse with the susceptibilities that Nipa was talking about. Uh, he defined them in 1934 as one half of I plus A, where I is the ionization energy of the molecule of the atom, and A is the electron affinity. And I want to go through the argument, his reasoning for why this is a good scale of electronegativity. So his reasoning was the, the following: uh, X and Y are going to have the same electronegativity if the energy cost of transferring an electron from X to Y and doing this reaction where X loses an electron and Y gains an electron, if the energy cost of this reaction is the same as the energy involved in the process where Y transfers the electron to X. So Y plus that's X minus. So if the energy uh, difference in this reaction, which is equal to, let's see, uh, the energy of X plus minus the energy of X, that's the ionization energy for X. Plus the energy of Y minus minus the energy of Y, that's minus the electron affinity of Y. If this energy is equal to the energy change in this opposite transfer, uh, let's calculate that. That's the energy of X minus minus the energy of X. That's minus the electron affinity of X plus the ionization potential of Y. Uh, if these two are equal, molecular reason, it must be because X and Y have the same uh, electronegativity. And so that means we, if we make these two equal, you get that Ix minus Ay is equal to minus Ax plus Iy. And so Ix plus Ax should be equal to Iy plus Ay. And so something proportional to I plus A seems like a smart choice for the for the electronegative. Uh, so let's let's keep it here for now and then come back to it. Oh sorry. I don't you took notes. Well, it's also like at the middle point uh, the half point between the home and the room. Exactly yes. so so we'll go back. Excuse me, may I ask you a question? I'm sorry? May I ask you a question? Yes sure. Yeah, this delta E is, is a strict, it's, it's 
expression for the delta t. So when there is this transition, I expect that the function of this guy, this reaction is not linear, it's not just transfer of production from a complexity to the moment. So, so I, I imagine the complete uh, uh, transfer of the electron and, and the dissociation, dissociated limit, right? So, so you, you have a full transfer of, of one electron from x to y. And then the, the energy change in that reaction is the sum of the energies of the ions minus the sum of the new Okay. Well, it's an electron transfer okay. reaction. Um, OK, now, uh, so the uh, point was uh, uh, it's more, more oxygen, more electronegative than nitrogen. And then, uh, so that, that explains that it's the nitrogen, the one that gets attached here. And because there are more resonance structures that stabilize the bond when it attaches to the alpha carbon than the beta carbon, then that explains the, the, the efficiency of this reaction. Now, in 1952, uh, Fukui uh, found something very interesting. And in fact, this chemical reaction I, I took from the Nobel lecture that he gave uh, in 1982. Uh, Fukui. <coughs> took this exact reaction and he did a simple calculation uh, doing linear combination of atomic orbitals with one PC orbital per carbon and then, then he plotted the HOMO and the HOMO for this molecule, let's plot just one fourth of the HOMO because it's symmetric so I'm going to plot the HOMO density <coughs> is higher uh, at the alpha carbon, so the, this means that the, the value of the homo density is higher at the alpha carbon than the beta carbon. Uh, and he proposed then that that's the reason that an electrophilic reagent goes preferentially to the alpha carbon. The density of the homo apparently is indicating uh, which locations in the molecule are the ones that are best for attracting an electrophilic reagent. So let's um, so electrophilic. Um, so, okay. oh. And come on. So it like this. Um, is, is, so, so you see this is uh, an index of chemical reactivity and it turned out, that's why he got the Nobel Prize, that it works for many, many chemical reactions. That if you plot the HOMO, the regions where the HOMO density is large tell you those regions where an electrophilic reagent is more likely to get attached. And similarly, uh, he found in other classes of reactions that uh, for a nucleophilic reagent, Nucleophilic. Then the LUMO density uh, serves as a good indicator. Those places in the molecule where the LUMO density is high uh, are correlated with the places where a nucleophilic reagent is more likely to get attached. And uh, if there are chemical reactions, like there are, there are many where the, attack, the reactant is neither electrophilic nor nucleophilic, but a radic normally a radical, um, then it was found out that one half of HOMO plus LUMO serves again as a good indicator of those locations in the molecule where the radical is going to attack. So this is all pre-DFT, right? Um, so in the, same, in the same way, that means for the NO2, the density is much lower. Like it's much higher around the, the oxygen than around. For, for NO2. Yes, yeah, so, so you see, this is a funny, funny uh, trick in, in, in here. So you consider the naphthalene as the molecule uh, for which you calculate the HOMO, and then 
NO2 is broadly described as an electrophilic uh, reagent. So if you then plot this, you're suggesting to plot the homo for NO2 plus. Or because well, no, the nucleophilic here is actually uh, uh, I'm sorry, so this refers to, to uh, yes, to a different set of chemical reactions. Um, all right, so uh, to complete the, the picture here, uh, we should say uh, something about the reaction, uh, the woodward hoffman reactions, because Foucault shared the Nobel Prize with Hoffman. So let's also mention the, the woodward hoffman reactions, one example, and then and then we, we go to the DFT uh, work. So uh, here's an example. This is butadiene. Uh, a carbon atom in each uh, point here and two double bonds. But here I want to have a methyl uh, group, uh, more C side, and, and uh, a methyl group here. Hydrogen here and hydrogen there. And again, this is a, a reaction where with high efficiency, something happens if you are in a dark room and you have a new raise the temperature or if you do the reaction uh, in the presence of light. So let's have here the same molecule. Uh, the first one, the top one, happens in the dark with heat. The second one happens uh, in the presence of light. In the first case, you form a cyclic uh, cyclobutene with one double bond here and exclusive, almost exclusively the cis compound. So with both methyl uh, groups sticking down or up, but both in the same direction. And for the case of the, of the light uh, reaction, then one, one methyl group sticks up and the other one it's down. But this is the cis and this is the trans. And he got the, the Nobel Prize uh, because uh, together with Woodward they proposed these simple uh, rules also based on the homos uh, and lumos, except in this case the density of the homo and the lumo do not work. Uh, you need to consider the, the phases of the orbitals that you're using in your linear combination. So let's draw here the four PZ orbitals. Uh, so let's draw the HOMO for this case. The HOMO uh, needs, so you have four pi electrons. And that means two doubly occupied states. So, so the first, uh, the second occupied state has one node. And that means that if this space here is positive and this one is positive, then you have a node here and then these two are positive. And uh, then due to the heat, then you increase the, the vibrations. And if it happens that the movement is this rotatory. Uh, if both you, you see if, if these both move in the same direction, you're going to close the ring because the positive and the positive are going to overlap. And and that's why you get both sticking down. Um, but in the presence of light, if, uh, and it's, remember these are very simple qualitative calculations, you use the same, same basis and promote, occupy the third level, then there are two nodes. There is one node here in between these two atoms. And then there's another node in between these two atoms. So this would be the LUMO. Then if this group moves uh, like that, 
and this group moves in the opposite direction in a disrotatory fashion, then you get explicitly the tracks. So uh, this led to this uh, uh, series of rules that are very useful, um, where, for example, for this case, if you have the number of pi electrons is equal to 4n, where n is an integer, then the thermal reaction happens with con-rotatory con movement and the uh, photochemical reaction happens with this rotatory movement. And there are many other, many other uh, woodwork Hoffman rules. So the point of all this is that these chemical rules have a very different character than rigorous uh, BFT. Right? They are called rules, they are not called theorems like Grunde Gross or Humbert Kohn, uh, and they work many times, uh, they break down, um, but they are, they are definitely uh, useful in chemistry, and an important question is whether they can be grounded uh, rigorously in BFT. And then work along these lines started in the late 70s and early 80s, and that's what I, I want to go over. So, so I'll uh, try to give you a more or less uh, self-contained introduction to, to this. I'll be writing the references. Um, first, we follow uh, Par and Yang, uh, 84. And I think Wei Tao is coming later uh, to the workshop. Uh, this was his, his first paper ever. Uh, not, not bad at, for a first paper in, in Jax. Um, so they, they did the following analysis. Suppose that, um, so, so they, they thought about this case, right? Um, consider uh, x and imagine that y comes from far away and x uh, can interact with y, that is so far perturbing x only slightly, and you calculate, the, you think of the energy of x uh, as a function of the number of electrons and the external potential, and you ask how the energy changes to first order uh, because of this perturbing second molecule. Um, and then, uh, so, it's a, so let's write dE, is then equal to, uh, well, the change of the energy with electron number at constant b plus the change in the energy uh, with the change in the external potential, so this is E3R, at constant n. times delta v. And the first coefficient here is the chemical potential, and there will be a lot more discussion about the chemical potential later on in other, other lectures. And the second coefficient is, can someone say, you see this is the, this is the ground state density at the minimum because Remember, the energy is, is f, this universal function of f, plus the integral of b times n. Uh, but f does not depend on, on b, so, uh, so think about that. And then let's, let's go one step further and calculate, and now think of mu as a function of n and b, and ask, again, b, b mu to first order is d mu dn at constant v times dn plus the change of mu with change in, in v at constant n the first coefficient was labeled by Barr and Pearson 
as the hardness, letter A there, and the second coefficient was labeled, and we'll see, we'll see why in a second, uh, in honor of Fukui as the Fukui function. So let's discuss all these four indices in some detail. And for that, of course, you see, they all involve derivatives with respect to electron number. Well, not, not this one. Uh, but this is the EDN. It's new. This is the new DN. And the Fukui function is all, so uh, you can write, you see, this is also equal to DN, DN at constant B. Uh, because, well, you see mu is the EDN, uh, so you have, it's like a sec second order, sec second uh, derivative of the energy with respect to V and uh, and the number of particles, and, and so you can exchange the variables and you find that this is equal to the MDN. You can do that as, as an exercise. This is equal to that. Um, okay, so the, since we have derivatives with respect to electron number, we should know how the energy behaves as a function of electron number. But unfortunately, or uh, fortunately, I don't know, uh, electrons come in units, and so thinking about derivatives with respect to electron number can be interesting, so energy versus number of electrons. Uh, let's say that, that here we have p electrons, and that here we have p plus 1 electrons, and here we have p minus 1 electrons. Then the energy for a regular system uh, behaves uh, in a convex way, uh, that is black mark. So the difference between the p minus 1 and the p-electron system is slope. The slope, uh, I'll, I'll have dash signs here. The slope is minus the ionization energy. Uh, it's always larger than the slope that follows here. It's minus the electron affinity. And let's first, uh, as a first step, uh, because it's easier, just uh, think about a finite difference expressions for these quantities. So instead, instead of the n being infinitesimally small, think of it as delta n for delta s, n is 1, and we, we write down the finite difference expressions here. So I'm going to erase the Woodward Hoffman. We, we come back to that again. Um, Let's start with mu. Uh, as, as someone said, uh, this is, uh, now let's use mu bar because I'm using finite difference expressions. Uh, well, you see it from here, right? The slope is, is, not, uh, is not the same from the left and, for, and from the right, um, but it, it's clearly, um, so if we want to assign a uh, finite difference here in this case is, is uh, uh, one half minus one half of i plus a. Uh, so that was a motivation for the coincidence of, remember the expression for mulligans, the negative was one half of i plus a. So Farr uh, was very happy about that and he said, uh, the electronegativity that we uh, use in chemistry uh, should be uh, defined as minus uh, mu. And it coincides uh, in this finite difference uh, expression as uh, the average, as the uh, as Mollikin's expression. Uh, this happened in, I should give you all the references. Uh, it was early on. This was the first, the first index in, in the FP. Uh, R et al. And I think et al. includes Mel Levy, um, JCP, 
78. Well, let, let's not talk about the density. You know the density was also used as a reactivity index by Linus Pauling in the third. Uh, the hardness also in this finite difference approximation will be given by E, the energy of the P plus 1 plus the energy of the P minus 1 minus 2 times the energy of the P electron system. And this is I minus A. The fu fundamental gap uh, for a material, the ionization energy minus the electron affinity. So why did they call it the hardness? And this was done by Pearson, I'm sorry, Parr Par and Pearson, 83. They called it the hardness because it turned out that when they calculated I minus A for many atoms and molecules, they found a striking correlation between what chemists since the 60s, that's a concept introduced by Pearson, called hard uh, acids and soft acids. So soft, softness was defined in that same paper as the inverse of the hardness. So you take a bunch of molecules and acids and bases and you classify them as either hard or, or, or soft based on some properties of molecules that include the number of valence electrons and the size and the charge. And then it was observed by Pearson that hard acids prefer overwhelmingly to bind with hard bases. And soft acids prefer to bind, bind soft, uh, soft bases. And uh, you can look up this principle called hard soft acid base principle. Uh, and it turned out that the hardness defined in this, in this way uh, could account for, for these types of, of parts of acid-base reactions. Paul Ayers has a nice paper from 2006 uh, explaining the physical basis of this principle based on this definition of the hardness. Okay, let's also write down the Fukui function in this finite difference uh, expression. Uh, but now you see the problem is we get something different uh, from the right hand for the left and, and so we should have also like for mu uh, an f bar that would be one half of the f minus plus the f plus. Whatever you get from the left of the integer, f minus, let's write down f minus. And you can do f plus, but f minus to the left of the integer in a finite difference expression is the difference between the p electron system and the p minus one electron system. Okay. Uh, well, but maybe maybe even before before moving on uh, to the case where you have continuous. Uh, continuous dependence on electron number. Let's stop here for a second and look at this Fukui function uh, in uh, an independent particle approximation where you freeze the orbital. So you say that the orbitals for the p electron system are the same as the orbitals for the p minus one electron system. So we call it a frozen orbital approximation to this quantity. And if the orbitals are the same, then in this subtraction, the only one that survives is the home of the p-electron system. So this is approximately equal to the home. So you see how, even at this point, uh, it's understandable that Parr et al. got excited uh, when, they, when they looked at this because the changing the chemical potential with respect to the uh, external potential, it tells you how sensitive the chemical potential is to a change in the, in the potential at a given point is in a frozen orbital approximation so far in a finite difference expression uh, for it uh, precisely what Fukui had used as a reactivity index to explain electrophilic attacks so the 
it is natural for them to think that perhaps uh, F minus um, is a, a useful index of chemical reactivity. And F plus is an index of uh, reactivity for nucleophilic attack. And similarly, F bar is, uh, is an index of reactivity for radical attack. OK, but the point is, this, these are not finite differences. These are derivatives. And the formalism for calculating the energy uh, as a function of electron numbers, a continuous variable, was done uh, in 1982, uh, the extension of the functional. This has not been discussed in the workshop so far, but it will be discussed, uh, I think, by uh, Lior partly and uh, Waiter Young will also talk about uh, this uh, derivative discontinuity. Uh, the, the, it's a very important exact result from the PPL, uh, PPLT paper from uh, 1982. Uh, and the result of the paper is that you can actually make these dark lines, you can make those solid lines. This is the behavior of the exact energy function of as a function of electron number. It's a linear interpolation. It's a piecewise linear function uh, that, uh, that you get for the energy when you go to ensemble DFT. And this will be explained. Uh, later on. Uh, the, the P stands for, for dropper U and the P stands for power. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting piece of history that, that combines this um, chemical reactivity. So, so we see this poses a problem for, for the indices introduced by power. Uh, you see how the chemists could get frustrated. Right? The electronegativity is defined by power as minus mu. And chemists want to have electronegativities for atoms. But the, the, this is the exact behavior of the energy as a function of the electron number. And mu is undefined at the inverse. So there is no such thing as electronegativity. That's the definition. Um, what about hardness? Hardness is the, is the, second, the second derivative. Uh, so it's equal to zero always, except that the integers, where you care about them, uh, where it is undefined. Not, not very good. Now, what about the Fukui functions? Well, the Fukui functions are in the same way problematic. Uh, they are saying, uh, this behavior is saying that f minus, f minus, which you find around here, for the, the density, um, is equal to F plus for the P minus 1. So F minus of the P electron system, which you want to tell you about the reactivity of the molecule towards electrophilic attack, is equal to the reactivity of the P minus 1 system towards nucleophilic attack. So, um, and then experimentally, that's just uh, not the case. You can find examples for about ten minutes. Ten minutes for no, not ten. Uh, three, four. Ooh, okay. Yes. Uh, so E here is the ground state energy of a system of P electrons. E is the ground state energy of a system of n electrons on a yeah. pairing. Yeah. 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 Right. So what do the points in the middle mean then? This no, no, no. Uh, in between the points. Okay, yes. That's, that's a very good question. Yes? Uh, and I, I, I'm, so, the, the, what, what PPLB did was to consider then a molecule uh, that can interact with a bat of electrons that is far away. And so, uh, so you can get uh, fractional numbers of electrons. Uh, in this sense, because you, so, so you, you have an open system that can, your system now can exchange electrons with a bat. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, so, so I think what, 
uh, what I'm going to do is to, uh, to leave this here for now and say this is a, a, a problem from the fu fundamental theory point of view, and I'm going to discuss a possible solution to this problem when I give my reasons to talk later on. Um, but now to make contact with DFT uh, more, I want to say a couple more things, a uh, couple more minutes. Okay. So first, uh, let's write down the exact expression uh, for n minus from the PPLB paper. Uh, we have that this is an interpolation between the P minus 1 and the P electron system. And uh, now we have here, I always get this wrong, so uh, nu, nu, and 1 minus nu. So if, if nu is in between 0 and 1, then when nu, when nu is 0, you are, you are at the P minus 1 electron system. When nu is 1, you are at the P electron system. And so this is the result of TPLD for N minus. So to the left of the integer, this is the behavior of the, of the density. Um, and I do this to show that actually this expression is, in fact, not just the finite difference approximation to F minus, but the exact result for F minus because the N minus dN, which is the Foucault function, see, dN, dN, dN minus dN. Uh, so d dN is the same as d d nu. And if you do d d nu here, you get np minus np minus 1. So nu is greater than 1. Uh, no, it's uh, this is zero, zero, and one. Oh, sorry. Um, so the real question is whether uh, if, the, if the Fukui function really can serve as a reactivity index, um, is this expression better at predicting reactivity than this simple expression. And Paul Ayers, again, it's a nice paper with examples, uh, and I'll give you the references uh, later on if you're interested, showing that in fact there are cases where the full F minus accounts for reactivity better than the, than the homo density. So there are cases where the homo density fails, but the full uh, Fukui function uh, predicts correctly the reactivity. Um, so let me write here an expression that I wanted to derive, but I, I really miscalculated. Uh, so let's write down this final expression uh, to live with uh, that f minus is the homo plus a correction, and the correction that I have to leave as an exercise uh, is the. Um, so it's chi s, let's write it um, to not get well, that double integral of r prime and r double prime of chi s r r prime. So this is the static version of the Cohen-Sham susceptibility that Nita introduced at the end of her, her, her lecture um, times the exchange correlation kernel, again the static version uh, that, that if I wrote down on the blackboard but derived later on, and F minus. Okay, so. so this is the correction uh, term uh, for F minus and uh, End of this 
So, uh, so uh, uh, there are cases where this term becomes important and hardly grows uh, with children in 2012. Have have a paper showing that um, uh, that that cases for for these uh, these terms is important. Um, okay, I, I probably better stop. I didn't get to it. Hmm? Yes. Okay. Okay, you can ask me about the connection with Woodward Hoffman because I didn't get to it. <laughs> <laughs> This is not really TDDFT, this is a static, uh, static version, right? So there's no time dependence. Okay, here. but you're still using a form of the formalism of the susceptibility. It's the static limit of the susceptibility that NIPA introduced. So why do you need that? It looks like you can just take the difference between the, the densities of the M minus one electrons and N electrons. But no, okay, so what I want to do is to connect with Concham, right? So, so in Concham, uh, this is the case for the interacting uh, system, but right? in Concham, you write this density n minus that integrates through a fractional number of electrons uh, in terms of non-interacting, uh, or in terms of orbit, that's Concham orbit. Right, so you take the sum from i equals 1 to p minus 1 of phi squared, and then you fractionally occupy the common with nu. And this is the p plus 1. No? Uh, sorry, p plus 1. And uh, and these orbitals, by the way, depend on, on nu. Uh, so then the question is, how do you go? How do you make that uh, equal to that, right? And uh, and and so so you need to do the n minus the n, uh, and the n is the same as the d nu. So you, you need to take the derivatives with respect to nu. So here you get from from here you will you're going to get the homo. But here you have a correction that will end up being this correction that involves the derivatives with respect to nu of all of these Cornsham orbitals. Um, and when you do carefully the derivatives with respect to nu of this. Uh, Term, uh, you find that it's precisely that. Okay, so I have another question about this. Um, so, but in, in the real chemical system, it's an ensemble state, right? It's a mixed state. You don't really have an orbital that is uh, when you have fractionally occupied systems. So, don't you need to change the formalism? For, like, couldn't you use the, uh, the ensemble formalism of DFT to? Changes, your that much. So, so you want to represent n minus in a different way. Yes, as a mixed state. Uh, you, so you uh, um, you want to represent n minus um, in, in this way, right? And represent n p minus one in terms of its own quantum orbitals and this in terms of its own quantum orbital. And that's something you can do, uh, and, and, it's, and it's different. Right? Um, so this expression follows from, from this way of doing it. Uh, and I believe Lior may mention perhaps uh, what happens when you do what, what you're suggesting, if, I have enough time. if you have enough time. Yes. Um, if you have enough time. Yeah. 
help you on i this is is it for same is it the same thing for t equal to be sign yeah so here we i'm sorry we don't have time this is all ground state right but i discussed and, and the definition of guy is the same as the definition that Nipa gave, except with no time. So it's the change in the density at R with the change in the conjunction potential at R prime. At the same time? Yes. This is omega equals zero. Omega equals zero. If you, if you take the one I defined, the energy transform one and you make omega equal to zero, then you get it. So this is You were speaking about how in, in real life in experiment, our bases react with high acid and some bases react with soft acid. And you also said that when we look at the piece of the that the exact functional, the hardness always is equal to zero or one thousand. So what strictly speaking, yes. What is the what is the meaning here? How are these things? Yeah, so it's a, it's a difficulty for the theory, and that's why I also wanted to show that there is room for, for theory uh, in, in this important area, because uh, the indices, as have been defined, are fine if the behavior of the energy is a function of electron number. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have any size of cusps, but the indices are undefined due to these cusps. Uh, so, so you you can resort to the finite difference expression. Can I just take the right and left a little bit to uh, like solve the issue of uh, uh, the harness not existing for the, for the n plus b? But besides that, it's zero. Away from those no, if you're in b, yeah, away from b, but if you're in b and you take the left and right a little bit, it's going to you get back to the normal definition. Yes, but remember what the goal of chemical reactivity was. You have two molecules, and you want to use properties of the molecules to predict the outcome of the reaction. Uh, and the molecules are isolated systems with a fixed number of electrons. And so you want the reactivity indices to be well defined at the integers. Um, So the these synthesis that have been derived uh, are not well defined at the end. Well, I don't know this in one because like the, the, the hardness is defined as the like the homo in some way. Uh, and uh, the, the only issue there is that the derivative is different uh, at that peak, at left and right, because on the left is minus pi and on the right is minus a. I just need to say that I need to take the left derivative and right derivative and say. Yes. Okay. So, so you are you are proposing that we use a finite difference uh, expression for for the definitions that come from from this analysis. Uh, yes. Yep. Is yes. Isn't so, mm -hmm. is the second derivative of that energy, which would be yes. zero? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So, so if you take a second, uh, a finite difference expression, then you get this I minus A, which is the expression that has been used for the hardness. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that, that, that's one way of defining it, uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, so it does not correspond to, to, the, to, to the, the real second uh, uh, derivative of, of the energy. One question. Uh, I think I may have misunderstood you when you mentioned that uh, uh, we have uh, basically the the, uh, the ionization energy uh, for uh, for for a species is uh, the, the equal to the uh, electron affinity for its uh, um, for its uh, for the ion that we obtain when we ionize it, and that seems reasonable to me. But then you said that we have a, a cases in reality where it's where not the case. Uh, like, uh, what are those cases? And I'm, I'm not sure. Like, if you really write this as a reaction between like an atom or a molecule, I remove an electron, I just read the equation the other way around, and I should, I should get the same 
I just take the, the bad choice, like the backward equation. So I do not really see how it can be that the uh, electron affinity of, uh, of uh, uh, an anion, uh, of, sorry, an anion, is different from the ionization energy of the neutral uh, species. Well, I was referring to Q functions at, at that point, okay? And what I was saying is that <coughs> the result that follows from this expression, from the PPLB paper, is that the Fukui function to the left of the integer, given by this expression, yes. is equal to, for p electrons, yes. is equal to the Fukui function of the p minus 1 electron system uh, with a positive sign. So if we want to retain the meaning of the Fukui functions as reactivity indices, we have a problem. But we're saying here that the reactivity or the tendency of a molecule to, at, at a given point, to react towards an electrophilic reagent is going to be identical to the tendency of the same molecule with one less electron to react towards a nucleophilic reagent. And and. And so, and, and that's, so I, I'm not sure if I can come up with an example now, but we we'll, would we'll be talking about, in this case, of the naphthalene. So remove one electron, you make it naphthalene positive, and then you bring a nucleophilic reagent. So we're talking now about a different, a different reaction, perhaps you were maybe thinking of the same. And uh, if, if these were right, we would be saying that bromine, bromide has to bind also to the alpha carbon because, because the reactivities are the same. And, and I don't know enough chemistry to say if this is the right answer, but it's probably not uh, right. So this is... Uh, uh, okay, I see what you mean now. Okay, the, the reactivity. Okay. 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 So I think we can leave other questions for that afternoon. And then thanks to Adam.